Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Public Accounts Committee to order and welcome everyone in attendance. My name is Shannon Phillips. I'm the MLA for Lethbridge West and the chair of this committee. As we begin this morning, I would uh, invite members, guests, and LAO staff at table to introduce themselves, uh, beginning with Deputy Chair. Yes, good morning, everyone. Cyril Turton, MLA for Spruce Grove and Stony Plain and Deputy Chair of this committee. Good morning, everyone. Mark Smith, MLA, Drayton Valley, Devon. Good morning, Muhammad Yassin, MLA, Calgary North. Grant Hunter, Tabor Warner. Good morning, everyone. Peter Singh, MLA, Calgary East. Jason Steffen, Red Deer South. Good morning, everyone. Jackie Lovely, MLA for the Camrose constituency. Good morning. Devinder Tour, MLA, Calgary, Falcon Ridge. Good morning. Uh, Mike Fernandez, ADM with the Ministry of Skilled Trades and Professions. Good morning, Olin Lovely, Senior Financial Officer. Good morning, Laura Pilipo, Deputy Minister, Advanced Education. Good morning, everyone. Carmen Baldwin, Dairy, ADM, uh, at Advanced Education. Good morning, Krista Carmichael, Advanced Education, ADM. Good morning, Doug Wiley, Auditor General. Good morning, Rob Dreesen, Assistant Auditor General. Marie Renault, St. Albert. Honorable Marlon Schmidt, MLA for Edmonton Gold Bar. Good morning, everyone. Rocky Pancholi, MLA for Edmonton White Mud. Good morning, Christina Williamson, Research Officer. Good morning, Nancy Robert, Clerk of Journals and Committees. Good morning, Aaron Roth, Committee Clerk. And I am not sure if we have anyone joining us online. No, we do not uh, uh, this morning. I think that's probably the first time in quite some time. So I'll note for the record uh, the following substitutions, Mr. Smith for uh, uh, Mr. Panda. And a few housekeeping items to address <clears throat> before we turn to the business at hand. Microphones are op operated by Hansard. Committee proceedings are live streamed on the internet and on Alberta Assembly TV. Audio and video streams and transcripts can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. And uh, please set your cell phones or other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. And just one additional note for members, other under business, we will have a motion coming on the topic of uh, enabling uh, uh, um, ASL interpretation for the uh, Community and Social Services meeting that is uh, uh, upcoming. So that will be under other business, uh, uh, friends. So we'll now uh, move to approval of the agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda at this time? So I'll ask that someone move uh, uh, to approve the draft agenda for today's meeting. Uh, moved by uh, Mr. Singh. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, that motion is carried. We'll now move to our uh, minutes. We have minutes from the May 24th meeting of the committee. Do members have any errors or omissions to note? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask that someone move that the minutes of the May 24th, 2022 meeting of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts be approved as distributed, moved by uh, Member Lovely. Any discussion on this motion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That motion is carried. I will uh, now welcome our guests from the Ministry of Advanced Education who are here to address the uh, Ministry's annual report of 21-22. Uh, the Ministry will provide opening remarks of uh, not exceeding 10 minutes, and uh, just for everyone's reminder, friends, we are in an ordinary two-hour meeting as we do not have a morning sitting. So with that, uh, I will turn things over to officials who have uh, graciously joined us on this cold morning, and uh, you have 10 minutes. Your time starts when you begin speaking. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about advanced education and our important work with the post-secondary institutions. I also want to thank everyone at the Auditor um, General's office. Your work helps ensure Alberta's adult learning system is efficient, accountable, and transparent. And this is essential in order for our post-secondary system to realize its potential. So fiscal year 2021-22, now that we're finally here, was a busy year for our ministry. We had a number of challenges and opportunities that arose as Alberta's economy began to bounce back. Reflecting back on the year, we're proud of the work that we've accomplished together. We made some major changes to existing legislation, and we continued to modernize Alberta's post-secondary institutions. I'd like to provide an overview of our departmental accomplishments as well as that are outlined in our 21-22 annual report. Advanced Education's consolidated ministry expense was $5.97 billion. This is an increase of $9 million from the prior year, and $107 million more than the budgeted amount. 
Post-secondary institutions made up the majority of these expenses, about 92%, which is an increase of 80 million from the previous year. This increase was primarily due to a recovery in overall expenses following the effects of the pandemic. Student aid, which is our largest category of spending, was 228 million. This includes grants, scholarships, and awards. This is a $71 million decrease from the prior year, as there was a pause on student grant payments, as well as a lower loan default provision due to, um, due to changes in how the costs were calculated. However, while overall student aid spending was down, we continued to provide meaningful support to learners across the system. This included $103 million in scholarships and awards to approximately 52,000 recipients, $49.2 million in grants to approximately 18,000 low- and middle-income student loan borrowers, and $743 million in Alberta student loans to approximately 105,000 borrowers. We also continue to diversify our student aid offerings. One example of this is the introduction of the Alex Dakota Award of Honor. It provides a one-time award of $5,000 to up to 200 Albertans who served in designated military operations. In addition, the department's financial support system, I'd also like to highlight some of the major program strides we've made in 21-22. By far, the most significant undertaking at advanced education is the Alberta 2030 Building Skills for Jobs strategy. Our intention was to set a bold, transformative, and compelling vision and strategic vision for adult, Alberta's adult learning system for the decade ahead. After several months of extensive engagement and analysis, we released Alberta 2030 on April 29, 2021. The strategy presents a transformative vision and a unified direction for Alberta's higher education system with defined goals, objectives, and initiatives for the next decade. Specifically, the strategy focuses on six goals. Improving access and student experience, developing skills for jobs, supporting innovation and commercialization, strengthening internationalization, improving sustainability and affordability, strengthening system governance. Each goal is underpinned by a set of objectives and flagship initiatives. This past year saw a significant progress in implementing initiatives under Alberta 2030, and we're beginning to see the important transformation take place. A major step in implementing Alberta 2030 was introducing Bill 74, the Advanced Education Statute Amendment Act. This bill amended the Post-Secondary Learning Act and the Skills, Trades and Apprenticeship Education Act, which I'll refer to as DEA, to align with Alberta 2030 strategy, reflect feedback from stakeholders, and simplify processes by removing red tape. Bill 74 made a number of key changes that have already come into force. This includes updating the preamble of the Post-Secondary Learning Act to better reflect the vision of 2030. As well, we provided authority to establish the Minister's Council on Higher Education and Skills. We changed the term limit limits for post-secondary institution board members to improve continuity and transferred authority to set apprenticeship tuition from the Minister of Advanced Education to the Board of Governors of Post-Secondary Institutions. The overall changes brought forward by these amendments have set the foundation for a renewed and collaborative model of system governance for the post-secondary education system in Alberta. And while this is a major step forward in implementing Alberta 2030, it wasn't our only success. Other aspects of the strategy we're implementing um, in the last fiscal year in 21-22 were to expand the apprenticeship education model to new programs and developing new work integrated learning opportunities and micro-credential programs with industry associations to support Alberta's key economic sectors and give Albertans more options for gaining skills and growing their careers. We also established the Research and Commercialization Working Group to expand economic diversification and research opportunities. And we streamlined um, program approval processes to cut red tape and give post-secondary institutions more flexibility to respond to the students and labor market, needs, labor market needs. As you can see, 2030 was a major accomplishment. Another focus of the department during this time was strengthening apprenticeship education and the skills trades. This work is significant and it's part of 2030 and it has its own origins from the Skills for, for Jobs Task Force. The task force included members from industry, labor, community agencies, and education leaders. A major recommendation was to modernize the Apprenticeship and Industry Training Act. 
In April 2021, the Skills, Trades, and Apprenticeship Education Act was introduced. It represents a full legislative renewal of the Skills and Trades Apprenticeship System in Alberta. I'd like to now move to the recommendations from the Auditor General. In advanced education, we strive to continuously improve outcomes for Albertans and ensure efficient and effective use of taxpayer dollars. That's why we appreciate the work of the Auditor General and the comprehensive review of the Anna Report. I'm pleased to say the 21 report only made one new recommendation to the Department. It recommends advanced education improve its process to estimate the allowance for uncollectible student loans. The Department has developed a new model that will be ready for an assessment implementation in 22-23. There are also four Department recommendations that are outstanding, and I'm pleased to say two of these related to the for-profit cost recovery ventures are ready for assessment. The remaining two related to collaborative initiatives among post-secondary institutions are being addressed through Alberta 2030 strategy, and we're confident the work of Alberta 2030 will address the outstanding Auditor General recommendations to the Department. I'll now move on to the Auditor General's recommendations regarding specific institutions. Like last year, even though the challenges of the pandemic persisted, all post-secondary institutions prepared financial statements on time. And the Auditor General's assessment noted no changes in the timing and accuracy of each institution's preparation of financial statements from 2020. A new recommendation was made to Lakeland College regarding promptly removing access credentials to its network for terminated employees. The department has worked with Lakeland College to address this recommendation and I'm pleased to report that a response was sent last month indicating that the recommendation will be implemented and ready for assessment by April 2023. Eight institutions currently have a total of 11 outstanding recommendations, including the new recommendation for Lakeland College. All of these are relatively new, with none being reported earlier than 2019. Of these outstanding recommendations, six institutions have been asked to improve testing and monitoring of the effectiveness of their internal controls. These institutions include the Alberta University of the Arts, Keanu College, Lakeland College, Medicine Hat College, Portage College, and Olds College. As noted in the Auditor General's report, the pandemic has created delays in these institutions' implementation efforts. However, we expect each of these institutions to complete an implementation plan in this calendar year. The remaining outstanding recommendations that are not ready for assessment include those from Medicine Hat College and Olds College. The two outstanding recommendations ready for assessment from, are those from Northwest Polytechnic and Northwest College. Lastly, one post-secondary institution recommendation from Keanu College has been implemented. This was a recommendation going back to 2013, and it was made to all post-secondary institutions. Keanu College is the financial institution to recommend, to implement this recommendation, rather. In conclusion, these are just some of the highlights from our 21-22 annual report, and the work the department has done and undertaken to build a strong, relevant, and sustainable post-secondary system. I believe we had a very successful and a very busy year. In addition to the work I've outlined today, we continue to make headway on other initiatives, such as red tape reduction, the international education strategy, and post-secondary funding and financial sustainability. This is all work that is done in the service of improving Alberta's post-secondary system. Uh, thank you, Deputy. We'll now move to the Auditor General for some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to summarize the outstanding recommendations relating to the Ministry. <clears throat> Pardon me. I thank the Deputy for doing my job for me, and I actually have nothing to supplement, so the time is back to the Committee. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we will now move on uh, to, just to remind everyone, we have uh, our first rotation is 15 minutes uh, for the official opposition and then go to the government side. So with that, we will begin uh, with the official opposition, uh, Member Schmidt. Thank you very much. Uh, my first set of questions has to deal with uh, education affordability. So page 51 of the annual report states that tuition revenue increased by $142 million over the previous year. According to the report, the increase is due to both increases in tuition and increases in enrollment. 
Can the department break that down? How much of the revenue increase was due to an increase in tuition and how much of the revenue increase was due to increases in enrollment? Sure. Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, the, the breakdown of the revenue and the breakdown of the tuition would be, um, first I just wanted to note that our, our revenue is generated by what, through a three-year um, outline of tuition increases that we provide to the post-secondary institutions. And my SFO is just providing me the breakdown. So we have 70% of that revenue is from enrollment, Chair. As well, we have a 30% um, of that is from tuition. And thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you very much. So uh, how much have uh, tuition and fees increased uh, across the system since 2019? Is there a specific that's referring to the same page, Chair? Just to yeah, uh, yes. So uh, page fifty-one, of page course, 51. the annual okay. report. So as as you as you know that the um, the tuition was marked to align with CPI, and I think that the the breakdown of that tuition. I'm just going to ask my SFO to go through the numbers oh, three over the last three years. Oh, okay, thank you. So. Um, after three years of the increases, it was expected. Um, first of all, I'm just going to go back to the increase that was related to Alberta 2030 when we started to look at the recommendations from the McKinnon report. Um, and those particular um, increases tuition also looked at other jurisdictions when we gave those particular numbers to the post-secondary system. And what we did was we looked at the fee increases and set each at 7% for the three years. And, and really looking at that as a way to ensure that tuition um, is a way that students invest in their education, and also making sure that Alberta was comparative to other jurisdictions. And, and essentially, we also looked at raising the cap on tuition to um, ensure that we had flexibility for the institutions to make decisions that work best for them. Um, and also just bringing so, um, so, the sorry, Deputy. Sorry, Deputy. Oh, uh, thank I, you. I, sorry, I, I get sorry, the sure. sense that... You're expanding on the answer beyond the scope of the question that I asked. How much have tuition and fees increased since 2019 here across the system in Alberta? Simple question, percentage amount, absolute dollar amount, that's all I'm looking for. I have here. the percentage amount breakdown, and I'm just looking to see if my financial area has the actual numbers over the last three years. I know that the average tuition in Alberta was just over 6690 so we would be able to, um, 693, I didn't quite remember that three. Um, so if we were to calculate that over the last three years, I, th I think we could, we could estimate it if someone wants to do the math. Um, so the, but we, I think I've answered the question, the breakdown it between the fees is 70% and 30% for um, the tuition. Right. Chair. N no, sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay. Well, We'll move on here uh, on, on this point. Page 36 states that the minister approved 14 exceptional tuition increases during the year in question. Uh, can the department table uh, for the committee at a later date which programs those were for and how much those tuition increases were for each program? Minister Nicolaides um, looked at the tuition, exceptional tuition increase. I'm just, just, I'm just Chair, asking. May, may I'm, I just, I'm just um, asking to, for you if you if the department can commit to tabling that for the committee. Chair, may I just answer the question first to outline the process as it's relevant to the answer? It's about the process. We can get to that. My first question is whether or not you will be willing to table that for for the committee. Minister Nicolaides took the exceptional tuition increase to cabinet for decision. So I would have to confer with the cabinet pa package that went before I can commit to the committee to table the, the documentation. So that's, that's interesting because the report says that it's ministerial approval. I'm pretty Correct. sure that that's written in the, in the legislation as well. Why is the minister going to cabinet for approval, uh, seeking approval for something that he has the authority to approve himself? Well, I think that um, by nature, an exceptional tuition increase is an important decision. And Minister Nicolaides asked the institutions to go back and do additional consultation. And he wanted to confer with Cabinet on an, a decision that, which was as important as exceptional tuition increases. Um, I will commit to the committee to confirm which part of the packages that were related to the ministerial authority and, and get back to what can be tabled. Thank you very much for that question. So with respect to exceptional tuition increases, the Alberta tuition framework states that the minister can approve 
uh, those tuition increases if he's satisfied that the increase will improve the quality of the program. I'm wondering how the minister makes that determination. What kind of rubric, matrix does the minister use to approve those, uh, ex uh, to determine that the, ex uh, the exceptional tuition increase will actually improve quality? How, what's he looking for there? Thank you for the question. That's a really important question, as an exceptional tu in tuition increase isn't just about in increasing the dollars. <laughs> So a couple things, and this is also why it was really important for Minister to go back and ask for consultation, because he did ask um, how the institutions were ensuring that the students were getting better quality. And part of the investment looked at hiring um, additional faculty, um, looking at the opportunity for expanded cooper cooperatives, work integrated learning opportunities for some of those programs. Um, which is which is what we call experiential learning or work integrated learning technology increases um, specifically in the areas for engineering um, also adding additional classes and supports and and also supporting learners through, through their programs thank you for the question is, it, is that a standardized process or is it ad hoc the minister looks at, at the proposal each takes it on a proposal by proposal basis and says Yep, or, or, or what is the definition of quality that the minister is, is looking for in, in these cases? Sure, that's it. Thank you for the question, Chair. That's an important question. So we did, we did a couple things um, in providing advice and analysis, both to the minister and to cabinet in considering the exceptional tuition increases. First of all, looking at the comparator programs in other jurisdictions, both from a cost and an outcomes perspective. Um, we also looked at whether or not um, those particular learners would be going into programs that had labor market connections. Um, as well, um, in looking at the comparator um, jurisdictions, um, just as an example, um, the minister had to consider whether or not it was a fair increase compared to other jurisdictions. So I'll just choose one. Um, an engineering degree, um, the tuition is just over 9000 now with the exceptional tuition increase, whereas at the University of Toronto it is just over 14000 So he had to look at comparator um, jurisdictions and institutions to ensure that there would be a quality that would be on par with other institutions. And then we broke that down by each program request, um, looking at both what the quality would be from the rubric that you're mentioning on the experiential, the staff, the quality of the staff instruction, how is that comparing to other jurisdictions, and then as well as I mentioned the outcomes that we would be expecting for those learners to receive um, in the labour force. Thank you for Thank the question. Thank you very much. So what kind of accountability measures does the department put in place to make sure that the institutions actually achieve the quality improvements that they're looking for? That's a really good question. Thank you for the question, Chair. One of the important um, um, measures that Minister Nicolaides has put in place is through the investment management agreements, which are required through the Post-Secondary Learning Act. So what he did was he actually put a work integrated learning measure in place for these institutions. Sorry, we're, we're going off track oh, here. I sorry. read the investment management I'm agreements. Sorry? They don't actually deal specifically with the exceptional tuition increases. I'm talking about only the exceptional tuition increases. What accountability measures does the Advanced Education Department have to make sure that those specific programs that have been approved for exceptional tuition increases actually achieve the quality improvements that they say they're going to do? Yes, thank you for that um, question. So my, my team is just talking about that we, ha we do have um, reporting that's required on, on the tuition to ensure that they're achieving their outcomes. Did you want to expand on that one, Carmen? Um, thank yeah. you, uh, Deputy, and thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, we do have an annual cycle of reporting on the tuition. So any program, for example, that is approved for an exceptional tuition increase, um, there's a team of data folks who actually review those submissions. And if we were to, for example, identify one of the institutions who was outside of the margin of what was approved, that would be a follow-up for us. When you're saying outside of the margin, outside of the margin for what measures? Of the exceptional tuition increase that was approved. So, for example, if the minister had approved um, an exceptional tuition increase for a, an MBA program at the University of Alberta, the University of Alberta would be required to report on that. If they charge tuition that were beyond what had been approved, that would be identified. Okay, so you're only tracking the, the, the actual increase in the, in the tuition. Now, the deputy minister just said that they promised to hire additional faculty, create work integrated learning, technology increases, additional support. Does the Advanced Education Ministry actually hold those tuition, uh, institutions accountable 
for providing the services and quality improvements that they say they will with the exceptional tuition increases? As I, as I did mention, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, while it is not directly related to the investment management agreement, we did put in place the work integrated learning performance measure. Um, and then the institutions the, the work, are the all required to submit annual reports. The deputy minister trying to answer the questions a few times and being interrupted by the honourable member who's been at this for almost eight years. He knows the rules and I'm, I'm not sure exactly why uh, he continues to do this. He's asking the questions but he's not listening to the answers. Now, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the point honourable of member? order... Um, yeah. Uh, is, there, is there a standing order? Yes. Okay. The, the point of order is, is 23J, um, so the, the member opposite is treating the ministry official, particularly with the forceful repetition of questions. First of all, she's trying to answer the questions, then he continues to ask the question again. Uh, and it's, it's going to obviously cause disorder in the committee. So I'm just wondering whether or not the chair will recognize that uh, she's trying to answer the question, that she, he needs to give, her, give him the answer to do that. Madam Chair, I think it's pretty clear that the member is asking questions and, and follow-up questions related to the responses being given by the Deputy Minister. This is not a point of order. Um, this is simply uh, the member using their time effectively to try to get an answer to the question that's being asked. Uh, and I just don't see a point of order on this situation. All right. I have uh, heard both sides. The first thing that I'll note is uh, that when I ask for a uh, reference to a standing order. Uh, I don't expect to be snarked at. The second thing that I will note is that there has been some back and forth. So uh, we'll, I'll just re remind uh, the honorable member uh, to ensure that he is speaking uh, through the chair and allowing the deputy minister to finish her answers. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my my sense is that because the department is, let's say, working overtime to avoid directly answering my question, that the answer is no, that there is no follow-up accountability uh, 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 process to make sure that the exceptional tuition increases actually achieve the, the particular quality improvements that they say they will do. Is that, is that fair? So just to be clear, Chair, the question is, are you asking me if there were or were not um, accountability? Just, I'm just sorry, I'm just confused on that question. Uh, what accountability measures okay. does the department have to make sure that the exceptional quality increases funded by these tuition increases actually happen? Thank you for that question, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll re reiterate that we do have two measures in place where we looked at the work integrated learning outcomes for those programs, and those are performance based um, work integrated um, learning metrics, as well as um, my colleague has also talked about the way that the reporting measures are done for tuition. And then in, in order as well, we do have program approval processes that, as you would, as you would know, Chair, um, that those are important parts of the process where we ensure that the outcomes from those programs are being met. And uh, thank, thank you, thank, Chair. Th thank you, Deputy Minister. I think you've answered my question. So, so there is no mechanism for qu clarifying whether or not these exceptional tuition increases. So. Uh, there, there's not, the ministry can't go back and say, you haven't done what you said you would do, we are going to force you to roll back your tuition. Is that, does, is there a process like that in place for these, dealing with these exceptional tuition increases? The, actually, there is a really important metric that's in place, which I've already mentioned. It's through the investment management agreement. And it is the work integrated learning metric, which that, is a performance-based that, that, that metric. That answers, that answers my question, Deputy Minister. I, I want to move on now. So page 55 references the so-called turnoff of the Alberta student grant to avoid going over budget. Yet on page 74, the department left almost $6 million in student aid grants, uh, uh, in student aid grants unspent in this fiscal year. Why was the department afraid of going over budget when you actually underspent your budget? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, it's an important question. Annual reports are an important part of accountability on how our dollars are spent. Um, I think that one of the things that we looked at when we implemented the new Alberta Student Grant Program was ensuring that we had the right measures in place to have accountability for how those dollars were spent. 
Um, as Chair and the member would recall that the first year the um, program was implemented, we were over budget. And because we were also implementing a new program in the middle of a second round of pandemic, we did an estimate based on the intakes that we had from the program and, and gave some advice um, based on data that we thought we could turn off the access to the program in um, September and still serve all the learners. Um, many cha many things changed during that that reporting so, period. So, oh, Chair, I'm just not quite finished my answer. Thank, thank you, thank you, Deputy Minister. You've actually answered the the question. I want to dig into that that now. How many applications had the department received by the time it turned off the grant, and how many grant applications were aw awarded, and how many were denied at that point? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't have that specific information in front of me right now, Chair. What I can say is that we did have a specific number of applicants that were approved. And as I was mentioning um, in my previous answer, due to the pandemic, we did have um, some, several students withdraw from study. So as we went into the January term, um, we were also noticing students that were withdrawing because most of the courses were going online. So it did change our numbers. Um, I can just look to the table to see if anybody has specific numbers that they would want to provide on that, or if we can get back. Oh, okay, thank you. So I can I can confirm that we had 17,000 students, Chair, um, that accessed the Alberta Student Grant um, during that reporting period. Uh, thank you, Deputy. We will now move over to the uh, government side for a 15-minute rotation. I have uh, Member Turton to begin. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, Ms. Pillipow and the rest of the team for coming out here today. Obviously, post-secondary education is of great importance to Albertans and especially to my writing. So I have a couple of questions, I guess, just first of all, I just want to just kind of uh, ask my first question based upon some of your comments about the Alberta 2030 Skills for Job Strategy. It's mentioned on page 26 of the annual report under outcome two. As you mentioned, it includes six ambitious goals, uh, which um, are concerning improving access, student experience, developing skills for jobs, supporting innovation and commercialization, strengthening internationalization, improving sustainability and affordable, affordability, and strengthening system governance. So specifically, I was wondering if you can comment on the progress and the actions taken in the 2021-2022 in support of the Alberta 2030 strategy and how it will improve the world-class post-secondary institutions that support many of my constituents, uh, specifically as uh, many people in the room know, Nate has a campus in my riding. It's obviously of huge importance. And I know um, the Augusta ca um, campus in Camrose is obviously uh, huge importance to the amazing member from uh, that riding as well. So if you can just kind of help answer that question, that'd be greatly appreciated. Great. Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, just as I mentioned in my opening comments, Alberta 2030 was a a, a very important uh, accomplishment for the year. So I'll just go over a few accomplishments. In spring 2021, um, we did release the strategy, as, as I mentioned, and it aims to ensure that the post-secondary graduates and uh, adult learners are equipped with some of those great skills that we talk about. So um, this strategy, we looked at some implementation items. Uh, we invited the post-secondary institutions to give us some feedback. And, and one of the things that we looked at was expanding the apprenticeship model. So we had 14 grants that were issued to nine institutions valued at approximately $6.4 million. We also invested $3.6 million to um, create the new work integrated learning opportunities by partnering with several industry associations in key economic sectors to provide meaningful paid work placements for hundreds of students. We also invested $5.6 million for post-secondary institutions and industry to develop micro-credential programs aligned with Alberta's recovery plan, which will help Albertans build uh, careers and especially when you're talking about areas like NEAT and colleges and, and looking at opportunities to go into the workforce and pivot into a career. We streamlined the program approval process which is an important red tape reduction measure. We also as I mentioned introduced the legislative changes to the post-secondary learning act. Um, we expanded inclusive post-secondary education and transitional uh, vocational programs with a 1.9 million dollar investment from the community and social services to help more Albertans with developmental disabilities reach their educational goals and prepare the workforce prepare for the workforce uh, 
and um, we were really excited because this funding will create at least 36 new spots for the for students with developmental disabilities to attend post-secondary education and finally, we established the Research and Commercialization Working Group, which brings together representatives both from industry, post-secondary education, um, as, as well as the research fields. And that's really a big focus on economic diversification and growth. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that answer. And um, I guess my second question, I know this, is, this has been a burning one. I know the uh, member from Edmonton Goldbar is very excited about this one, but it has to deal with what's on page 27 under key objective 2.1 and that has to do with red tape reduction obviously this is a huge issue about uh, making sure that our uh, public services are, are um, done efficiently and effectively so I'm very excited obviously that the ministry has exceeded the 2021 to 2022 targeted red tape reduction of 20 percent achieving a total of 26.5 percent so I guess I was wondering if you can expand on the steps that your ministry has taken to lessen regulatory requirements and reduce administrative burden for post-secondary providers, employers, and students. Thank you for the question, Chair. So um, this is an important initiative for government, and we took this exercise seriously. There are two major student aid initiatives that were documented for 21-22. Um, we looked at a student aid paperless initiative, um, online full-time application removal of um, as well re the requirement to remove mandatory spouse or partner SIN numbers that came into effect on August 1st of 2021. Um, by removing this mandatory SIN requirement, it also supports the Student Aid Paperless Initiative and reduced our time and effort and also being able to serve students faster. Uh, we, we looked at the Student Aid Regulatory Count um, and effective on August 1st, 2021, we repealed four applications for a requirement reduction of 97. Um, and really just everything that we do um, is with priority and making um, post-secondary education easier to access. Um, we also, as I mentioned before, we have improved the approval process um, to eliminate unnecessary application requirements, enabling universities to undertake independent reviews and improve turnaround time for program uh, approvals. And as I might have mentioned as well in my in my opening comments, we transferred the authority to the Board of Governors um, for to set apprenticeship tuition, and this came out of the consultation from Alberta 2030. Um, we also replaced the annual mental health funding for students at post-secondary institu institutions with multi-year agreements. Um, this really helps the institutions plan over those, those um, three-year period. Um, we're also with the new Skills, Trades and Apprenticeship Education Act. We reduced red tape for educators and industry, given workplaces new tools to meet um, new challenges. And then we also are modernizing the governance of skills trades by providing more flexibility and autonomy. Um, we've done several other things in that area. Um, we're looking at streamlining as well the apprenticeship record book to eliminate an, any of the duplication and unnecessary requirements used in administering that program. And also consolidating reporting um, under My Trade Secrets, um, a secure online service, which means apprenticeship and industry training clients can view and update their program information anytime. Thank you for the question, Chair. Excellent, and, and thank you very much for the comprehensive answer. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over to uh, my good friend, Emily Singh. Thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank you, Deputy Chair. I would like to thank the Office of Auditor General for been with us today and also representative and officials of the Advanced Education Ministry. My questions are about skills development and apprenticeship, and I do understand trade and skills is important in all writings in Alberta, including cameras as well here. And on page 12 of the annual report, delete outcome one, providing quality education and skills development to Albertans, highly educated and skilled graduates are essential to our economic growth and prosperity. <clears throat> Key objective 1.2 on page 20 speaks to expanding the apprenticeship model to increasing learning opportunities to meet labor demands. And what has advanced education done to ensure post-secondary programs in Alberta foster the skill development and apprenticeship that reflects the labor market demands. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chair. 
To ensure the post-secondary programs um, foster skill development and apprenticeship that reflects the labor market demands, Alberta Advanced Education has continued collaboration with industry to ensure apprenticeship programming provides training for skills that are required in the labor market. We've increased seat numbers for apprenticeship classroom instruction at post-secondary institutions for high demand apprenticeship education programs. We've also developed a clear apprenticeship model of learning that can be applied to more careers. Thank you for the question, that's my answer. Thank you for the answer. And uh, if you please, can you elaborate on some of the additional actions and programs undertaken uh, by advanced education during 2021, 2022 to support the apprenticeship model uh, of education? Thank you for the question, Chair. The Ministry, in order to enhance and support the apprenticeship model of education, we passed, as noted earlier, the new Skills, Trades and Apprenticeship Education Act to modernize and increase efficiency in the legislative framework and apprenticeship programming. We also created the post-secondary credentials to be awarded upon successful completion of an apprenticeship education program, which newly recognizes the education of tradespeople and provides greater opportunity to ladder into other academic programs. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And I'm uh, very much interested in one of the strategies outlined on page 21 of the annual report to support high school apprenticeship for aspiring tradesmen and women. This includes the high school apprenticeship scholarship program introduced by this government. And how is this program supported high school students aspiring to become skilled trade workers in Alberta? Thank you for the question, Chair. The High School Apprenticeship Scholarship Program recognizes the accomplishments of Alberta high school students completing the registered apprenticeship program, known as RAP, or the Career and Technology Studies Pathway. This program has been in place since 2013, but was renamed, um, as noted, in 2019. There are two awards that fall under this program. Um, the standard award recipients are given $1,000. Um, those awarded the Bright Future Award also can uh, be eligible to receive a total of $2,000. RAP allows an Alberta high school student to register as an apprentice and begin learning and developing skills and competencies on the job. As they work, they will earn wages and a, head, and, and a high school credit and on-the-job apprenticeship hours um, for a head start towards journey person certificate after high school. The Career and Technology Studies Pathway to Apprenticeship Program also provides an opportunity for Alberta high school students so that they can earn a credit towards Alberta um, Apprenticeship Classroom Instruction in 23 different programs. This important program um, allows Alberta Education High School apprenticeship related um, students to be able to be part of their career studies. Um, and, and this is also a provincially authorized curriculum for those students. Thank you for the question. That's my answer. In, thank, uh, thanks for the answer here. And I see on page 21 that the program has awarded 2,622 scholarships to students as they graduate from high school. What were the eligibility uh, requirements to apply, and how were these scholarships awarded? Thank you for the question, Chair. To qualify for the high school apprenticeship scholarships, applicants must be a Canadian citizen, a permanent resident, or a protected person. Visa students are not eligible. They may be an Alberta resident, as defined by the address on file in My Trade Secrets. They must complete the requirements for a high school diploma in June of their graduating year. They must be registered or as an apprentice in the register, registered apprenticeship program or have successfully completed a career and technology studies apprenticeship pathway through an Alberta high school. And finally, they, um, they, cannot, they must not be a previous um, a recipient of RAP or, or the um, career, um, career and technology studies um, scholarship. Thank you for the question. That's my answer. Thank you for answering my questions and appreciate the hard work done to support the skills development and apprenticeship program in our province. And I cede uh, the remaining of my time to Member Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, how much more time do we have? Two minutes. Oh, two. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, 
allowing me to uh, ask a few questions of you today. As a former high school stu uh, social studies teacher, uh, uh, advanced education has always uh, been something of, of a natural uh, bent for me, uh, looking forward and, and moving forward uh, as I saw my kids moving through the, the, the uh, post-secondary situation. As we all know, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, I think I could speak for all of the MLAs here, uh, that we got a lot of uh, feedback over the last couple of two and a half years uh, from parents as they and their students and their, their kids as they struggled to, to make their way through advanced education in a COVID era. So as we all know, the pandemic posed specific challenges to post-secondary post students and to their mental health. Um, page 28 of the annual report mentions that the ministry uh, replaced annual mental health funding for students at post-secondary institutions with multi-year agreements. And I'm pleased to see that our government is supporting the students' mental health in the long term. Uh, but could you uh, please uh, further elaborate on uh, what these agreements look like and uh, the benefits of, of having them as a multi-year agreement rather than just as an annual agreement that, that may change every year from year to year? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, as noted, these new grant agreements um, are three year in length rather than in just one. And that was one of our red tape reduction initiatives as well as an effort to be able to provide some consistent um, funding year over year. These, they are issued and, and, um, and reports are due annually in order for the department to be able to monitor spending and progress of the initiatives. Um, the 16 page grant application template that the post-secondary institutions have to fill out, um, it's only filled out once every three years now, so it allows them to be able to um, be more efficient in their, in their distribution. The funding has remained a, a consistent priority and also being able to provide this level of funding um, has been able to provide certain supports within the post-secondary institutions. It's increased access to counselors. It's developed um, campus mental health strategies. All right, now we'll move on to our 10 minute rotations. This is the second rotation. We'll begin with the official opposition at uh, 10 minutes and I am seeing Amber Schmidt. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I wanna go back to page 55 and the Alberta student grant. So when the deputy minister left off, she said that 17,000 students had accessed the grant before the program was paused. How many applications were denied or were in the works, I guess, when, when the program was paused? Thank you for the question, Chair. That's a fairly detailed program question. Um, I, I'm going to have to get back to the member about that specific issue, unless there's someone at the table that can give that detailed information. Okay. Tabling the information. So, so other, other programs that advance educate or other scholarships awards that grant, advanced education administers don't have a fixed budget. And I, I, I'm thinking of the Rutherford Scholarship, for example. You meet the criteria, you apply, you submit your application, you get your money, and it doesn't matter how much is budgeted. The the department pays each recipient who meets the eligibility criteria. It, that's the same for the Jason Lang Scholarship and other scholarships that, that the Advanced Education Program administers. In theory, from, looking, from the outside looking in, the Alberta Student Grant is set up the same way. If you meet the criteria for eligibility, you should get your grant. What were people who were denied the grant told when the program was paused? Presumably, were they told when when it was paused thank you for the question chair um, I can't speak to exactly what um, recipients were were told but I can talk about um, the number of students who received the grant I also want to talk though um, I think the member um, chair would be aware that there are a suite of programs that we provide students and that we do have a budget that we have to work towards um, and that this particular program was developed by combining previous grant programs um, to target low-income learners. Um, we know that we did serve, as I mentioned in my opening comments, 17,965 students. And those who were unable to access the um, Alberta Student Grant funding for the balance of the year, we, we did encourage them to apply for the next year. But as, as the member knows, Chair, um, we also have federal and provincial student loans. Uh, we have other grants and numerous scholarships and awards that we are that are offered to students as as a measure of them being able to um, provide for their their education options. Thank you for the question. It, it, 
Thank, thank you very much. So, I, you, you set up a program that clearly highlights eligibility requirements, then you arbitrarily cut it off at some point when you think you're going over budget, even though you end up not going over budget over the year. What did the Ministry of Advanced Education learn from this, I would characterize it as a blunder, to make sure that people who are eligible for the Alberta Student Grant in upcoming years will not be denied a program that they can fairly expect to receive when they meet the eligibility requirements? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I appreciate that when officials give ministers advice that we may, as the quote is, blunder from time to time. Uh, we do use the data that we have at the time to provide advice. And as noted earlier, um, that was the second year of implementing that program. And we had to manage varying registration numbers coming in from post-secondary institutions during COVID and, and provide our best advice. So because it is a finite budget, um, we did look at the recipients and those who were coming into the program. We also knew that we had um, over $103 million in that reporting year for um, scholarships and awards, and also additional dollars um, that we provided $743 million in student loans, uh, which helped Thank you very over much to the Deputy Minister. She's students. going beyond the scope of the question. So uh, are you looking at changing the eligibility requirement then for the Alberta Student Grant? Is that a question that's related to something in the annual report? So, uh, yeah, sorry, um, Honourable Member, I have a point of order on the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Under um, 23B, speaking to matters other than the question at hand, um, really the purpose of PAC is to talk about the, um, you know, the uh, previous business statements, auditor, uh, general statements. I mean, what the honourable member is talking about is really forward-facing. Uh, policy statements, I would probably assume that most of those questions would be better suited for question period coming up here in a couple hours uh, versus uh, the actual business that we're supposed to be addressing here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. I, I will restate my question. Yeah, I'll just rule that, uh, 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 yes, could you please restate that question because uh, it was uh, outside the bounds. Thank you, Honourable Member. Thank, thank you very much. So. Recognizing that the Alberta Student Grant could have possibly gone over budget uh, in, in this fiscal year, did the ministry make any eligibility changes in this fiscal year for applying for the student grant or in order to reopen it? Thank you for the question. I'm actually I'm wondering if my ADM, Mike Fernandez, wants to talk about the intricacies of shutting off a program and the criteria. Happy to. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, um, just to, just to go directly to the question, um, we would look forward to speaking to that at PAC next year, when we share with you the 22-23 results. Um, but would you like me to elaborate on the intricacies of program cessation in mid-year? Yeah. I, I was accountable for it at the time and, and was involved in making the decision. Uh, no, that's fine. We we'll, we'll we'll move on. On page 74 of the annual report, again, no. Uh, uh, the, the, the ministry shows that $3 million in scholarships and awards was unspent in this fiscal year. This follows up on fiscal 2020-2021, in which over a million dollars from the same light item was unspent. Why can't the ministry spend the money it allocates to scholarships and awards? Thank you for the question. Um, I think that, when it, are you referring to the Alex Decote? Which one are you referring to? There, there is a shocking lack of transparency in the budget. All, I, all it says is line 4.2, scholarships and awards, $3 million unspent. So I don't know which, which awards were un, underspent here. So, um, thank you for the question, Chair. Actually, um, as, the, as the member noted, Chair, that um, scholarship programs are, are demand programs. So um, when scholarship programs are unspent, um, there, are, there are dollars that are unused um, is be just simply because we did not have sufficient applicants for those programs. Thank you very much. So this is money that could very well be put to use or put to very good use by students who are in uh, serious financial aid. What is the department doing to increase applications to make sure that you're actually spending the money that you allot for this uh, every year? Thank you for the question, Chair. Are you referring to the specific program um, with the question? I, I, again, 
I don't have the same information that the deputy minister does. I'm referring to line 4.2 in the in the lapses and encumbrance on page 74 uh, of the budget. You, the deputy minister just said that you're not getting enough applications to spend all of the money that you're allocating. What are you doing to prom There are presumably more students out there who could use this money and might meet the eligibility requirements. What is the department doing to promote that to make sure that there are enough applicants in the system to spend the money that you want to spend on scholarships and awards? As, as part of the program requirements, the, the scholarships and awards do have an intake um, period. Um, I'm just wondering, Mike, are they in? Yeah. Can you give me the intake dates, please? Because I know you're familiar with them and I'm not. Intake date is usually yeah. June 1. June 1. The first two weeks of June yeah. is when things open. So, Chair, I think that what we would say with respect to the question on scholarships and awards, that there is a period of time where we have intake and then we, we assess those applications. And then, as you would, um, managing your budget through quarterly reporting, we would also provide advice um, to the minister on um, dollars that were unspent in certain programs. When you have an in-flight um, unspent amount of money, then you have to assess that. Um, thank you. Um, then you have to assess that um, within your quarterly reporting options. And, and also what we do ask, um, as my colleague here has noted, also noted, that we also require that the post-secondary institutions um, promote on their websites um, and ensure that students are aware of all the student finance options for them. There's a full suite of options here um, that are available to students. Thank you for the question. Thank, thank you very much for the answer. This is a this is a problem that has existed for at least two years. Like I said, in 2020, 2021, you underspent the budget by $1.6 million. This year, or this past year, uh, you underspent it by $3 million. So the amount of money that you're not spending has actually increased significantly. But it doesn't sound like the department has changed any of its uh, uh, processes, promotional um, uh, work to make sure that that money goes out the door. Is that fair to say? Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's the, qu the question's referring to section 4.1, so I'm not sure how it relates to promotional. I think what we would say is that we have a constant reporting of our student finance options on our website. Um, I also want to note, as I look at the uh, FLE counts from 2018, 19, 19, 20, um, that we had seen in some institutions a slow increase, um, whereas in others we have seen a decrease. So I think that um, not to say that COVID is responsible for everything, but it does become challenging to manage, manage enrollments and withdrawals from students when their post-secondary experience was um, going from online to in-person, which does impact our ability to be able to process programs per our existing requirements that we have during the reporting year that you would be referring to in the end report. Thank you for the question. Is the department did the department consider making any changes to make sure that more of that money was spent this past fiscal year? Uh, all right, we'll move on to the on second rotation government side. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and through you to uh, to uh, Ms. Pil Ms. Pilipal. Um, I was happy to read on page 32 that advanced education, uh, coordinating with the Associate Minister of Status of Women, announced a $2.5 million investment in the post-secondary system to combat gender-based violence. How has this funding addressed gender-based violence on Alberta's campuses? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, post-secondary institutions are using this funding in a variety of, of ways <coughs> to address gender-based violence. And we, too, were very happy to partner with our colleagues in the status of women. Approved activities identified through the grant agreements um, are as follows. Um, you could use it for updating post-secondary institution gender-based violence policies to align with national best practices, and that is something Minister Nicolaitis has asked the institutions to look at. Enhancing capacity through the delivery of gender-based awareness and prevention training to students, staff, and faculty. Development and promotion of campaigns that are focused on education, awareness, and prevention. And then lastly, implementing a province-wide survey to assess the prevalence of gender-based violence on campus, along with perceptions of the campus climate and supports that are available. Thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you, and I'll, I'll cede my time to MLA Hunter. Thank you. Through you to uh, Madam Chair, to the honorable members here. Um, 
I see on page 43 that the percentage of provincial grants the Alberta government provides to post-secondary institution represents 48% of the total revenue among uh, Alberta's publicly funded universities and degree granting colleges, uh, which is significantly higher than British Columbia's 35% and Ontario's 26%. Um, and I can see also that, uh, that these numbers have remained relatively stable since 2015, uh, between 46 to 48%. So how has the significant funding from the Alberta government worked to ensure that our post-secondary students are among the most well supported and funded in the country? Thank you for the question, Chair. So Alberta has always focused on the importance of adult learning in Alberta. And in the 21-22 fiscal year, um, this was the second year of the planned three-year uh, process to better align Alberta's post-secondary institutions with other jurisdictions in a steady and sustainable ma manner. Advanced Education did um, look at other jurisdictional funding as recommended by the McKinnon panel and reduced government funding and allocated funding differentially to Alberta's publicly funded post-secondary institutions, which saved over $106 million in the reporting period for 21-22. So this, this helped promote the sustainability of the post-secondary system and ensured that funding was distributed in a more equitable fashion, as opposed to across the board approach that was used in previous years. The province continues to show a downward trend in terms of provincial funding on a per student basis, which is aligning better to um, cross-jurisdictional comparisons. <coughs> And we're also positioned for strategic investment um, that can have a better impact uh, on the post-secondary system and the Alberta economy. In addition, Minister Nicolaides also had introduced um, the investment management agreements, which I referred to um, earlier, which are important accountability measures and which are essentially contracts between the public, publicly funded post-secondary institution and the Minister of Education as required by the Post-Secondary Learning Act. These IMAs, as we refer to them, are the primary accountability instrument of a performance-based funding model. And they incentivize institutions to work collabor collaboratively to also um, implement the goals outlined in Alberta 2030. Thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you for the answer, um, Deputy Minister. I can also see that uh, over the past year, many sectors of our economy began to face labor shortages due to the lack of skilled workers and on page 14, it mentions micro-credentials and strategies to support people of, uh, to reskill or upskill, as, as, uh, as it says. Can the ministry expand on the different programs and opportunities that your department offered to adult learners to quickly reskill and access other employment? Thank you for the question, Chair. I'll talk about two programs in response to the question. Um, the Work Integrated Learning Industry Voucher Program and Micro-Credentials. Um, Will, as we call it, um, this was a, vo a voucher pilot program that began in March of 2021. Um, Advanced Education invested $3.6 million over a three-year period. We, we worked with three industry associations to support over 650 Will opportunities under the program. Um, these partners were the Alberta Construction Association, Technology Alberta, and Bio Alberta, who were chosen for their alignment um, to key economic sectors as part of Alberta's recovery plan. Um, these three pilot um, associations submitted their annual progress report on May 31st of 2022, um, which is outside the reporting period, so I won't re refer to the actual results. Um, we also see that um, a a the ACA has also launched their program. And in the first year, we, tour, we saw 80 students that surpassed the goals of the program. Bio Alberta began recu recruiting as well um, with the Will Voucher pr um, Program in August of 2021. And we also see that the, key, the, the KPIs for this program saw that the number of students and the number of employers involved was lower than the previous year one as the program was newly promoted. So we're looking at some growth there. We do, however, see that the association is beginning to go on track and as we're looking into future years. We also note that Technology Alberta, who was part of the Will Pro um, Voucher Program through two separate cohorts, were meeting their placement targets as well. A, a very important um, initiative under 2030 is the Micro-Credential um, Program. So in partnership with um, industry employers and PSIs, we had um, over $5.6 million that was um, invested in a pilot program to develop 
and implement these new micro-credentials. So this program is creating dozens of new micro-credential opportunities in priority sectors and high demand emerging um, industries. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of those. So um, the ministry approved um, 56 programs under the micro-credential from 19 institutions for the pilot. And the participating post-secondary institutions submitted their annual report um, progress um, in, in the last um, fiscal year. And um, of the funded programs, 61% um, were in the delivery phase and 38% were still developing. We also note that um, higher rates of, in, of registration um, in these micro-credential programs were, were observed in programs that offered will components, so the combination of the two was really important. Um, and what we also noted that the um, ability of rural colleges to find and involve industry is something that hadn't been completely um, uptaken, and we'll be looking at that in coming years and how we can support those colleges in rural Alberta. Thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you, um, Deputy Minister. And I'd like to cede my time for, to uh, the Honourable Mohamed Dissi. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Deputy Minister. Um, my first question is with regard to outcome 2.3, key objective 2.3. Outcome 2 of the annual report was making Alberta's adult learning system efficient, financially sustainable, and globally competitive. Key objective 2.3 mentions that the previous government spent more money per student than similar provinces, but did not necessarily get better post-secondary results. It also states that this previous spending was not sustainable and a more equitable approach was required. So can you comment on the steps your department has taken to transition to a more sustainable funding model that aligns more with other jurisdictions in our country? Thank you for the question, <coughs> Chair. After reviewing the findings of the McKinnon panel report, the department, um, under the leadership of Minister Nicoletti, set out on a three-year process to better align uh, Alberta's post-secondary institutions with other jurisdictions. Advanced education reduced funding um, through the government and allocated it funding differentially to the Alberta um, publicly funded post-secondary institutions, saving over $106 million in 21-22. This helped promote the sustainability of the post-secondary system and ensured that the funding was distributed in a more equitable fashion, as opposed to the across-the-board the approach that was used in previous years. We also um, look at, at being better positioned, as I mentioned earlier, for a strategic investment um, to have the biggest impact on the post-secondary system in coming years because of these reductions. Thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you. And uh, how has the Ministry ensured that Alberta students and post-secondary institutions are still best supported? Thank you for the question, Chair. Goal three of, of this year's um, process, the goal of this three-year process was to ensure that the Alberta post-secondary system, as I mentioned, was funded in a more sustainable manner. So the way that this funding um, is distributed also helps post-secondary institutions plan over those three years. In addition, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. We'll go on to the third rotation. Official opposition, 10 minutes, I see. Uh, Member Schmidt. Thank you very much. I want to return to page 74 of the annual report. Uh, there was more unspent money, but this time in the line five, foundational learning supports. Uh, more than $14 million unspent in foundational learning assistance. The annual report suggests that this is due to lower than expected enrollment what was the expected number of students enrolled in programs eligible for this assistance and what was the actual enrollment? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, I'm just asking my SFO to pull the expected numbers. I, I will note that when we, when we did our analysis of the variance um, explanations on this program, that part of um, our, oh, thank you. Part of our numbers, um, we had, we're, we're really looking at how we could manage the influx of that program through COVID. So we expected 10,500 learners. Our actual numbers were 8,200 member. Thank you for the question, Chair. Okay. 
So presumably, again, like Alberta student grants, there is a significant amount of financial need out there that is being unmet because the department is not spending the money that's allocated in the budget. Now, the, the money for foundational learning assistance, I need to remind everybody on the committee, is going to support low-income Albertans for completing high school education and in, in some cases even completing the education that they need to complete a high school education. So these are people who are at risk of being trapped in, in low-income positions if they aren't able to finish their foundational learning programs and go on to higher education. In my view, I think it's critically important that the ministry is doing everything it can to make sure that Albertans who are eligible for the program know that it exists and can take advantage of the opportunity. What initiatives did the department have in place in 22, in fiscal year under consideration to encourage enrollment in foundational learning programs so that you're spending the budget that you allocate for this? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, obviously, the foundational learning support program is an extremely important program for low-income Albertans, and we would agree with you on that. And I know my ADM, Mike, um, Fernandez can talk a little bit more about the specifics. Um, I think I would say that we have we work very closely with our partners who deliver these foundational learning support programs. I don't have the exact number, but I think the member and um, chair would, would probably remember that during this reporting period, we had almost a 10% unemployment rate in Alberta. So we also have um, qualified applicants that were looking for this program that um, it would, there was just a lower uptake. So we work with our partners and we advertise um, the availability of these programs. And I'm wondering, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about love the, this year? Because I know you love this program. Yeah, so I, I do love this program, Laura. So, so thank you for the opportunity and for the question. Um, so the Foundational Learning Program is a, a partnership between the Alberta government and 45 partners. Those partners include not-for-profit entities, um, a handful of my post-secondary institutions or PSIs, several of my First Nations colleges that I work with. Um, we work with them on an annual basis to make sure they are allocating the right dollars, the right programs in community. We undertake um, some pretty aggressive, marketing is the wrong word, but sort of advocacy to make sure that potential participants are aware across the province, all demographics. Um, the biggest reason that there was some a significant underspend in 21-22 on FLS was COVID. So when we look at the demographic of learners of, of the foundational learning community, they are your, they are your least likely to attend post-secondary education because they've got different barriers that most of us don't face in terms of access to technology, access to internet, uh, their confidence to come into a facility. COVID just compounded all of that. And I mean, th this was a trend that was seen across the entire post-secondary education system where enrollment was down, but in FLS it was compounded, so. I appreciate the explanation. This was the second year of COVID. I note that in 2020, 2021, this program was also significantly underspent. What did the department learn from 20, the first year of COVID to, make, to, to try to avoid this happening again? It, because it looks like you weren't successful in, in addressing the challenge, the, the, uh, over, helping people overcome the extra barrier that COVID put on, on people. Thank you for the question, Chair. I will refer the question to ADM Fernandez. Thank you. I didn't need to have a sip of a yeah, drink. No problem. So COVID, um, for the purpose of committee today, did span two fiscal years, two academic years. Um, in year one, we did see a reduced enrollment. And, and to respond to that, we worked with our 45 partners to try and analyze why and what happened. And predominantly in year two, we encouraged them to make greater access of computer hardware and internet connectivity available to pot potential participants. So I actually believe that we were quite successful in the enrollment in year two in that I, I personally believe it would have been diminished significantly more had our partners not made um, computer access and hardware access available to learners. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, my next block of questions deals with institutional funding. So. Uh, according to the briefing provided by the Legislative Assembly Office, operating grants to post-secondary institutions have decreased by over $400 million since the 2018-19 fiscal year. Now, how much of that shortfall, some of that was covered by skyrocketing tuition that this government has uh, uh, approved, but how much of that shortfall in base operating grants resulted in budget reductions of post-secondary institutions? Thank you for the question, Chair. I'm, um, I think I'm just referring my 
back to one comment that I made in the opening around the reductions that we had to the base operating grant in 21-22, which was, on, was 106 million in savings. Am I correct? Okay. Um, so that was what that was the reduction to specifically answer the question, um, Chair. Thank you. Um, and I think also, um, as the member knows, Chair, that we did look at um, how Alberta compared to other jurisdictions, both for tuition and for the funding per institution when those decisions Thank you, thank you Deputy Minister. I, I appreciate the, the question. So over since 2018-19, uh, how many full-time equivalent positions have been lost at post-secondary institutions because of the shortfall in base operating grants? I'm just going to go back to my enrollment numbers. Um, so just one second, I just have to find my page. I didn't remember all 26 of the... Uh, well, just to be clear, the Deputy Minister uh, was not asked about enrollment, but it was full-time equivalent positions at, at post-secondary institutions. Um, I don't actually know if I have that information. I'm just looking to the table to see if we have that information. I apologize, um, Chair. We'd have to get back to you on that. Thank you very much. I, I know that that's a number that's presented in the budget every year. I look forward to that being tabled to the committee at uh, at the next time. Is the ministry keeping track of any programs that have been eliminated because of these budget cuts since 2019? The program approval process that we go through uh, approves the programs that are offered by the institutions, and then we look at the cost per FLE. Um, I'm just going to ask Carmen, your area does the program approvals. Do you also get reporting on our annual reporting basis on the programs that are removed? And thank you for the question, Chair. My apologies. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Chair. Um, the institutions do not report to us in a consolidated rolled-up piece, so we would not receive a report from Nate that says we suspended or terminated this many. However, as a result of each individual proposal that they put in to suspend, add, terminate, whatever it is they want to do, we would be able to compile that report internally. So in other words, they do not provide it to us as a whole, but we would be able to um, do that. Can, you, can the department then table that report to show which programs have been lost since 2018-19? Uh, I think that that is something that I have to first um, confer and look and see what the data looks like as well. We can, we can commit to looking into an, an, an option to answering that question, Chair. We can see what the data looks like. You just need to provide it to us if you're willing to do that. We'll, we'll commit to looking at what data we have, Chair. Thank you. Uh, not much of a commitment at all, actually. Uh, I, I would like the, de the Deputy Minister to say de definitively <laughs> whether she can provide the committee with that, with that data. I'm committing to looking at the data that I have and then providing <laughs> it to the, the committee. I have not seen the data myself, Chair, so I just want to make sure that I'm we're providing the adequate answer to the question. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess a lead-in uh, question to the next block. Government ended the practice of changing the base operating grants evenly across the board and now makes them on a school-by-school -school basis. The University for of Alberta, for example, gets much bigger cuts than other institutions. What criteria does the ministry have for determining how much the amount of the base operating grant will change for each institution from year to year? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, as I noted earlier, the institutional changes that were made um, in the budget 2019-20 um, put in place a three-year plan for reductions. Very good. We'll now move on to uh, government side, 10 minutes in the third rotation. Uh, Member Yassine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Deputy Minister, you were in the middle of answering my second question, which was how has the ministry ensured that the Alberta students and post-secondary institutions are still best supported. You can continue with your answer. Sorry, I'm just looking at my, my papers. Need to count. I'm sorry, Chair. Just one second. Thank you. Um, the second part of your question and the answer. Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, we've also, when we look at goal three um, of this, goal, the goal of this three-year process um, was to ensure that the post-secondary institutions were able to align with other jurisdictions. Um, we also put in place investment management agreements, as I was mentioning earlier. 
um, which is an accountability instrument of a performance-based funding model, um, which are used to incentivize institutions through Alberta 2030. I also have some additional information that I can provide on student aid changes, but I just want to confirm, um, Chair, that this is the question that the, um, the, the member would like me to elaborate on. Thank you. Uh, we move on to my next question. Uh, top institutions such as the University of Calgary, SAID, play a crucial role in attracting and training our workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. Now, your key objective 2.4 on page 36 was to strengthen post-secondary research, commercialization, and investment attraction, and, attra and attract qualified international students who remain in Alberta and contribute to the economy. With labor shortage affecting many sectors of our economy, a skilled and adaptable workforce is becoming more important than ever before to ensure our economy's continual growth and stability. Can the ministry talk about the international education strategy mentioned on page 36 and how has this strategy or how this strategy will help allevi alleviate labor shortage in our province. Thank you for the question, Chair. As noted, um, the department um, under Minister Nicolaitis' leadership did um, release an international education strategy. The strategy focuses on three key priority areas, global talent attraction, smart and sustainable growth, and international skills needed to succeed. So prior to the pandemic, we, we did actually host um, over 35,000 international students um, between the post-secondary and the K-12 system. Um, and those students contributed more than 1.1 billion to Alberta's economy and also supported over 13,400 jobs in communities across the province. Um, the international education strategy would confirm that international students play a critical role in addressing labor shortages and the ministry is working with partnering ministries to align talent attraction and support Alberta's labor market needs and our research and innovation priorities. I also want to note that the minister established um, the research and commercialization working group, um, which is an important working group to get advice from both industry and the post-secondary system um, to be able to enhance some of our research and attraction opportunities with international students. Thank you for the question, Chair. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. And I will pass on to my colleague, MLA Tour. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And uh, just want to start by saying thank you for the, all the work you do. Advanced education, I think, is very important for Albertans, especially the postgraduates who get their education. And uh, so I just want to put my question uh, related to performance indicator number one on page 45, which measures the percentage of employers who report that the recent post-secondary graduate they supervise are prepared for employment. And I do understand that's important because uh, the student who are going to get some work experience during their education, I think uh, more chances they're going to get job before the other students. So the question is, what did advanced education do to help students gain work experience during their studies? Thank you for the question, Chair. The research on the, the Alberta system has indicated that post-secondary students who are given an opportunity for work experience uh, while they learn tend to get a job sooner. So Minister Nicolaides has worked to introduce the Work Integrated Learning Program, which I spoke about earlier. Um, this program builds key skills um, that employers are looking for, including professionalism, team communication, and emotional intelligence. Um, we've also taken um, direct action to expand student um, opportunities for work integrated learning. As I noted earlier, the Will um, Industry um, Voucher Pilot Program um, was an important pro program and an investment. Um, and also just, um, just noting again that um, we worked with three really important sectors in Alberta to support that program, the Alberta Construction Association, Bio Alberta, and Technology Alberta. And, and just to note, we have some really good feedback from students through our student surveys um, about those experiences as well. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. 
Well, I'm glad to see on page 34 that uh, 11.2 million dollars were allocated to provide services, sport and accommodation for students with disabilities at mostly I think all 26 publicly funded institutions. This work continues the ministry's long-term strategy for helping students receive the accommodation and support they need. So my question is, can you provide specific details on how this funding has helped uh, these students meet their education needs? Thank you for the question, Chair. The number of students with uh, disabilities seeking accommodation and services from the 26 publicly funded post-secondary institutions grew by over 100% um, from 9,565 to 19,219 students between 2011 and 2012 over that 10-year period, 2011-12 to 21-22. Um, so often these students require multiple services. Um, this funding ensures that students with disabilities accessing these, accessing these supports and services may seamlessly and successfully participate fully in their programs of study. And this is an important part of being um, in the post-secondary system from an inclusive lens. The goal of accommodating students with disabilities is to ensure full participation in all aspects of their education experience. So the program looks at um, supporting students with accessible facilities, um, flexible course delivery formats, individual services, ex assistive technologies, flexible formats for exams, um, and other methods for student evaluation, which are really important for the learning environment. This funding also supports student appointments um, for intake, documentation review, determination of disability related services and supports that are needed, and it allows PSIs to accommodate students with disabilities by giving them their own uh, accommodation policies within the institution. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your answer. Do you still have two minutes, so I'll pass my time to MLA Stefan. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the work you do. Uh, I have a question about performance indicator 1A in your annual report, which is a really important uh, performance indicator. It measures the percentage of post-secondary graduates who reported being employed uh, two years after graduation. And we note that in 2020, graduates from the majority of fields of study had employment rates uh, higher than 90 percent and the uh, most annual updated information will be available in the next annual report as I understand but uh, for 2020 how does this rate compare uh, to post-secondary graduates uh, in other provinces? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, this is an important part of the investment of uh, taxpayer dollars in the post-secondary system as we do um, conduct the graduate outcome survey. Alberta's postgraduate employment uh, rates are comparable with other Canadian jurisdictions, um, including British Columbia and Ontario. When we look at British Columbia and Ontario's latest employment rates in 2021, um, they were at 93%, um, compared to Alberta's, um, which were at 95% and 93% comparably between 20, 2021 and 2020. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, I know we will run out of time here, but uh, the next question I'd like you to think about uh, when we get time back is how did um, our uh, outcomes and employment in terms of uh, technical and trades education, uh, such as at Red Deer Polytechnic, compare to universities? And if you could uh, just kind of think about that um, in terms of our focus on uh, supporting the trades. Uh, in terms of market demand. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member. We'll now move to the fourth rotation. Uh, official opposition, 10 minutes. Member Schmidt. Thank you very much. I just want to go back to the question that I left before uh, I ran out of time. What criteria does the Ministry have for determining how much the amount of the base operating grant will change for each institution from year to year? Thank you for the question, <laughs> Chair. Um, as I noted, the it, all institutions were given the three-year um, the three-year agreement, if you will, for their base operating grant reductions. And the criteria that was used um, to assess the, um, the the base operating grant. Actually, I'm just going to double check with Olin because I don't have that criteria in front of me. Yeah, you don't? Okay. 
So what we did have was an assessment of base population demand. Um, I know that that was used in um, prior years as well. Um, and then looking at um, the distribution of funding between FL cost per FLE and, and comparing that between different institutions. So that is, the, that is the information that I have at this time, Chair. Uh, all right, I, I, I'll, I'll move on then. Investment management agreements have been signed with each institution. And the IMA for, uh, with McEwen University, for example, states that 15% of its base operating grant is at risk in the 22-23 year, and that increases to 40% by 24-25. What's the rationale for increasing the amount of at-risk funding so quickly? So are you referring to an IMA that's reported in the 21-22 annual report? Well, I, outside of the reporting I, I, I mean, I, I mean the, the annual report talks about signing investment management agreements. I'm referring to a specific investment and management agreement that was signed with McEwen University during the fiscal year, states that the base operating grant at-risk funding rapidly increases to 40%. Why is that the case? Why is I'm just confirming, Chair, I'm going to answer the question as it relates to the fiscal year 2021-22 in the annual report, where Grant McEwen would have signed an investment and man management agreement as required by the Post-Secondary Learning Act for a 5% performance-based um, funding um, related to the work integrated learning targets that were set. Thank you. What happens? What happens to the base operating grant if an institution fails to meet a target? The investment management agreements are set up with um, a series of baseline measurements. So when Minister Nicolaides put a pause on the performance-based funding during COVID, the, the second year they looked at work integrated component. Um, it was used as a measure to, um, it, I'm just looking at the targets, just one second, sorry. Um, it was intended to increase the proportion of programs that were under that the work integrated learning target. And then what, what the ministry does is they work with each institution on what we refer to as a tolerance band that is applied to that target. Um, and then those institutions are required to report on the outcomes of the target that's set within the investment management agreement. Um, the tar target and the tolerance band are both approved by the Board of Governors and the minister. And the minister's ultimate goal is that all the programs would contain the will component. Um, also very happy to report that all the institutions did meet those targets in the reporting year for 21-22. And if one of those institutions did not meet that target, then the minister would look to see if there was a, um, any, any room within the tolerance band for that target that could be met. Um, and then SFO, is there anything that you want to add with respect to funding? Thank you. So <clears throat> if the uh, institution did not meet their target in 21-22, uh, the assessment occurs in 22-23 and then the reduction would occur to the base operating grant in the year following, so 23-24. Okay. okay, so the reduction in the base operating grant does happen if they don't meet the target. Thank you very much. What happens if they exceed a target? Is there any reward uh, set up, a financial reward available to them through the base operating grant if they exceed their targets? The investment management agreements as they're set up right now are meant to achieve the target themselves. They are not meant to reward um, anything outside of the target that's set. So it's, it's just sticks. Thank you for the question. It, Sorry. It's, it's just sticks, no carrots. So what happens to the money that the that is reduced then to the base operating grant of one institution when they fail to meet a target? Where do, you, you, it sounds like you're budgeting for that money to be spent because you anticipate every institution to meet a target. If they don't, where does that money go? Thank you for the question. As noted that we do have, we work on the targets with the institution and I just have the one um, target that was um, reported on in this reporting year for the work integrated learning. Um, and I'm just going to ask Olin Lovely, our SFO, do you have anything else that you'd want to add if there, with respect to where the funding would go if there was? This is a hypothetical situation, Chair. As the member knows, I indicated that all institutions didn't meet their targets for the work integrated learning. Thank you, Deputy. So if the, if the target wasn't achieved, uh, the reduction would occur to the institution, and then there's sufficient time within our budget to be able to reallocate that internally uh, as part of the, the next year's budget. So 
um, as we're going through this process right now. We know that no work integrated learning targets were, but if they were, then we would be going back to Treasury Board and indicating that um, we didn't need as much funding for that fiscal year. So you're essentially clawing back the funding and turning it back to Treasury Board if they don't meet a target is, is what I heard. Now, I, I want to go back to uh, the McEwen Investment Management Agreement. I recognize the Deputy Minister is a little bit reluctant to, to, talk, to talk about this, but the metric that was set up in the 22-23 IMA that was signed includes, post -secondary, uh, includes a metric that's ultimately outside of the post-secondary institution's control, and that's employment outcomes. So systemic reviews of these performance-based funding schemes have conclusively demonstrated that... Uh, sorry, uh, Honourable Member, I have a point of order on the floor. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Under 23B, um, well, I appreciate the uh, enthusiasm for the Honourable Member to ask that question. He is specifically referencing 2022 to 2023, which is outside of the scope of PAC. Our time period that we're supposed to be looking at is 2021 to 2022. So I would just ask the Honourable Member to stick to the time period that we're talking about here today. If the Honourable Member would like to rephrase, he can go right ahead. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Obviously, these investment management agreements were in the works in the fiscal year uh, 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 under consideration. And so I want to understand the Ministry's thinking in developing these things. Okay. Ask it that way, then. Yes. So thank you very much. I, I'm not going to re re restate my question uh, to, to the Chair again. but. Systemic reviews of performance-based funding schemes have conclusively demonstrated that when given employment outcomes, post-secondary institutions start to admit students who are more likely to get a job right after graduating, meaning that racialized students who face more barriers to admission than before find it even harder to get into those institutions. Now, this is, this is well documented. I can speak that this information was provided to me when I was minister of this department. You guys know that this is happening. What safeguards are in place to ensure that racialized students aren't denied access to higher education because these employment metrics are now being imposed on post-secondary institutions? Thank you for the question. I'm just, just to be clear, you're referring to the section in the end of report around the investment management agreements, member yes. chair? Yes. Okay. Um, so when we look at the parameters that are put in place for um, any post-secondary institution in the investment management agreement, as I mentioned, we set the performance-based indicator with the institution. Um, they also have an option of determining the percentage that's allocated for within that IMA to certain one of those measures. Um, there's a couple things that we don't have control of as the ministry, which is, what, which is why we work in collaboration with the post-secondary institution and why the Board of Governors has to sign it off. Um, we don't have access to um, the post-secondary institution admission standards. Those are their standards that they look at. Um, but what we do do, as we do fund, as I mentioned, uh, work integrated learning opportunities. We have approved programs that focus on employment um, within those work integrated learning programs. And um, I think that I, I have no control over the admissions of a registrar for a university, but what we are doing is, is supporting the institutions to be able to have intakes for programs that meet the outcomes of accessibility um, through the identified goals in the Alberta 2030 strategy. Thank you for the question. So, we know that this clause in an investment management agreement does create disadvantages for racialized students. Has the, did the department consider uh, monitor, collecting any data based on admissions just to see so that they can track over time how well racialized students are, uh, how successful they are being admitted into post-secondary by institution to, to understand if this is a problem that needs to be addressed since we know that it's a problem in other jurisdictions that pursue this kind of funding agreement? Thank you for the question, Chair. I'm not familiar with the data that you're referring to, Member, so if um, there's anything that we have at the table that I'm not aware of, that's really helpful. I think one of the things that I also want to note, since the Member's asking questions about investment management agreements, is that Minister Nicolaitis has also really um, placed a lot of emphasis on the importance of implementing all aspects of Alberta 2030 and in the investment management agreements, which includes the inter international education strategy and, as I mentioned, work integrated learning. So that is an important aspect for us to be able to look at bringing in students that are in, um, in need of 
um, supporting the labor force, as well as meeting the outcomes that we've identified in our international education strategy. Alrighty then, uh, government side, 10 minutes for our fourth rotation, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so just to uh, restate the question that I had asked uh, in terms of employment of graduates in the trades, um, could you please uh, share with us uh, the trend and uh, what that looks like in the trades vis-a-vis uh, -vis other options for education? Thank you very much for the question, Chair. I'm going to give um, a base level answer and then I'm wondering if my colleague um, Mike Fernandez wants to give a bit of data. Um, so a couple things, we do use the Graduate Employment Outcomes uh, Survey, which I mentioned um, to the previous question. Um, and that's measured by biannually through, um, and we look at the Apprenticeship Education Survey as well. So we do pay attention to graduate outcomes for both um, trades and um, post-secondary degree programs. The employment rates of graduates in publicly funded post-secondary institutions, so it doesn't include apprenticeship, apprenticeship has been very stable over time. We look at about 95% of the graduates from the class of 1920 were employed for approximately two years after graduation. Um, the employment rates for the graduates vary slightly by a demographic group, but generally um, an increase is based on credential level. Um, we also look at um, this survey from the 2020-2021 for apprenticeship graduates, and we see that 92% of those um, reported um, being employed following um, their schooling, which is comparable to the results from the, um, the survey that was taken in 2018-2019. Is there anything you want to add? No, that, that was great, Laura. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question, Chair. Sure, I just have a, a supplemental question. In terms of graduate employment, um, what impact, uh, if any, were you able to observe um, as a result of the COVID environment which uh, students were trying to work and make a living under shortly after graduation? Um, did you have any findings from that when you were speaking to students and finding if they were able to find work? Because uh, certainly, I'm sure a number of government policies and actions uh, did impact employment opportunities. Could you share uh, some information about that? Thank you for the question, Chair. The, um, the best indicator that we have on employment post-graduation um, is the, the data that I referenced from the Graduate Outcomes Survey. Um, which we also use as, it's a lagging indicator, so the data that I had mentioned um, from here um, would be that we'd see 95% of employed, of students from that 1920 range were um, indicating that they were employed. As I noted earlier though, obviously 2021, 2022, we saw a much higher unemployment rate across Alberta. So um, I don't have specific information on whether or not we worked with the students past um, the graduate outcome survey though. Mm, okay. We, we also had difficulty getting some data um, outside of our um, graduate outcome survey um, because some of the businesses that we worked with under Will were not operating during COVID, so we did have a little bit of a, a lagging um, indicator number. Aside from the outcome survey, though, Carmen, can you confirm if we have any other data? Um, thank you, Deputy. Um, I would need to probably go back to the data team on that, but one thing, and I'm expanding a wee bit on your question here, but you're, you're speaking to employment post-graduation. Certainly one thing we observed is that through the efforts to expand the work integrated learning pieces, so whether those were, you know, whether that's a six week, um, somebody who's in a diploma or certificate program who just needs a two, three, four, five, six week uh, experience versus somebody who's doing, you know, a whole, a whole term uh, co-op type of experience because many of the businesses and employers were struggling there were there was certainly it was harder to find those experiential opportunities mm -hmm. for students when they were in their program and we know that those experiential opportunities Increase. often lead to employment mm -hmm. post yeah. Yeah. sure uh, maybe if, if there's any information that you could provide to the committee a uh, specific information on how the job market uh, for graduates was impacted uh, during the COVID, uh, that would be helpful for us to learn from, and, and I'm sure for your department and this government. Thanks. Thank you for the question. We'll look at um, the data that we have from our graduate outcome survey that we can provide to the committee. 
And then, um, as I mentioned before, I'll see if there is data that I haven't seen, then we can also assess whether it would answer the question that's been asked by the committee. Thank you. And with that, I'll end my questions. Thanks. And uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, through you to um, the deputy and the team, I just wanted to say my colleagues have made reference to Camrose, and it's because I speak very dearly of uh, the activity that happens there, including Augustana campus. And they have a number of international students that are registered there and were registered during COVID. Um, so I'm interested in the international education strategy outlined on page 36 and the strategies used to ensure that Alberta's post-secondary system retained the current number of international students and was able to keep attracting and enrolling new ones despite the challenges with international travel for students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you outline how effective these strategies were at retaining international students and how many international students did Alberta have before the pandemic and how many during the 2021-22 year? Thank you for the question, Chair. Um, this is definitely an issue that's affected many post-secondary institutions, including Camrose. Thank you. Um, we, we do see that... Um, the international students did continue to travel um, to Alberta during the pandemic and to study at institutions that had completed a pandemic response plan. Um, those plans were fairly comprehensive. I won't go into too much detail, but they did require a 14-day um, quarantine period. Um, we also um, facilitated adoption of a temporary changes to the postgraduate uh, work permit program. Um, so all students who were enrolled in that program um, as of March 2020, um, and it started a, a program as of the spring of 2020, were, weren't required to um, complete 50% of their programs of study in Canada. So that helped to increase the number of um, international students that were able to come. Um, and then up to 100% of their program could be completed online. So we provided more opportunities for those international students to be able to um, practice those studies if they couldn't come to Canada um, during the pandemic. We did see, though, um, the number of um, per our, our data that we have on international students, a small decline in 2020 and 2021. But we are starting to see um, some recovery. So, for example, in um, the number of international students over the last four years, 2018-19, we had 25,230 international students. In 2019-20, 28,245. Um, and then we did see a dip in 2020-2021 to 27,228. Um, and then we're starting to see an uptake um, in the last reporting year to 29,990. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. the answer. On uh, page 16 of the annual report, it explains how the Community Adult Learning Program ensures that adult learners can access part-time, non-formal literacy, and foundational learning opportunities. Can you elaborate on how this program supports adult literacy among Albertans? Thank you for the question. I'm just looking for my question. Sorry, just one second. I apologize. Thank you. This is referring to um, an important program that member um, asked about earlier, the Community Adult Learning Program. Um, this program provided $16 million in annual funding to support foundational learning opportunities and approximately $2 million in annual funding to professional development to increase their capacity to deliver quality foundational learning programs. So this would include anything from part-time, non-formal literacy and foundational <coughs> literacy opportunities. Um, as we call it, um, CALP, um, it's a really important program as well because it, it supports rural, remote, and urban communities across Alberta, which is a really important access um, outcome. Um, and they, they are working to meet those foundational needs. And often, those are the only community-based um, provider that can deliver that face-to-face -face program in some of those smaller communities. So to ensure access, um, we funded over 80 unique um, organizations to serve all those urban, rural, and remote communities, and this includes Indigenous communities as well. And specifically, we looked at literacy and foundational learning that are funded under KELP, so that would focus on adult literacy, um, numeracy, skills for learning, basic digital, English language learning, um, as well community capacity building, um, so a really important part of the outreach um, portion, looking at general equivalency and diploma support, mental health, uh, substance abuse, family violence awareness, Indigenous, French, and local language cultures, diversity and inclusion, and parenting skills. 
as well these programs provide family literacy programs and and importantly as well looking at those learner support services so that they can have job search and resume support as well as um, any sort of exam supports for them during the process thank you very much for the question that's the end of my answer thank you what has been done to address recommendation number six from the Auditor General? Okay, well, we're now on to the fifth uh, uh, rotation. We have three minutes uh, for the official opposition and three minutes for the government to read any questions into the record uh, that we then ask the department to follow up within 30 days in writing to the committee clerk. With that, I will uh, turn things over to the official opposition. No additional questions, Madam Chair. All right. Over here? Sure. So if I could have the answer for what has been done to address recommendation number six from the Auditor General, and also what has been done by the Ministry to address recommendation number seven from the Auditor General's office. Uh, so, uh, Deputy, that was just for, for written follow-up. Um, there's uh, no need to uh, uh, follow up at this time in, in writing is fine. So I would like to thank officials from the Ministry of Advanced Education and the OAG for attending and responding to committee's members' questions. We ask uh, that responses to any other outstanding questions be provided in writing. Uh, just making sure, sorry folks, uh, that uh, there were no other written questions. Oh, there was. I'm sorry, uh, Member Stefan, that was my fault. Sure, I'd like to ask for uh, a written response. Uh, if any information that you have on uh, student satisfaction with their post-secondary experience, uh, how that was impacted uh, in the COVID environment with uh, many institutions going online and having other access restrictions into their uh, physical facilities. And sports. couple minutes left but uh, it looks like the government side is uh, finished with that then I will not interrupt you again thank you um, and uh, now we're on to other business friends uh, we uh, do have a possible motion uh, uh, that has come through some conversation between uh, myself and the deputy chair based on past practice of when the um, uh, community and social services ministry comes to visit us based on their old name and their old uh, 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 lines of work that uh, we have had uh, uh, American Sign Language interpretation for that department to come and so we have a possible motion to invite uh, ASL interpretation for the December 20th meeting as well. Uh, I believe there is a possible motion if we have one up there on the screens for uh, members to have a look at. Um, if I, I, I could ask for a mover. Okay, the deputy chair has uh, uh, moved it. Is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, sure, Member Panzoli. Sorry, just a question about um, why we wouldn't have ASL at every meeting. I'm just curious more about is it a cost issue? Is it because I appreciate there'll be particular interest for the December 20th meeting, but certainly access is important. Yeah, there's some additional context uh, uh, from the table here. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, you know, that is a committee decision. If the committee would like to, uh, like to request that uh, ASL be sought um, for, for, the other, for the other meeting as well, that's, that's totally up to the committee to do. Of course, the considerations um, um, in the short term are availability. Um, we we have, uh, in anticipation of this motion coming forward, we have reached out to um, the interpreter company that we use uh, to provide interpretation for the daily routine every day, mm -hmm. and um, we're hopeful that that they've they've got someone available or a pair a pair of people available for the meeting on the twentieth, and we're just awaiting waiting a response. So. Yeah, go ahead, Member Churton. Yes, no, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I just want to say, um, how, again, how much in support of this particular motion I am. I think, uh, especially given just the nature of the information that will be presented and the discussion, I think it would just be um, uh, wonderful to be as inclusive as possible so that the maximum number of residents can pay attention to the proceedings of that PAC meeting on the 20th. Thank you. Member Renault. I think um, I just wanted to echo sort of uh, what um, 
um, Emily Pancholi just said about, you know, looking into, you know, perhaps time doesn't, we don't have enough time to bring in American Sign Language uh, for next week, but that we, going forward, that we have ASL at all meetings. I think that's just an outstanding uh, suggestion. Thank you. So I think what I'm hearing is that if, if just to propose a way forward, uh, we were to move uh, ahead with this particular motion for the December 20th meeting, then the committee, uh, and uh, I don't know if we need to pass a specific motion to this effect to direct the chair and the deputy chair to examine the options for future uh, meetings during the spring sitting. Is that, uh, do, do we consider ourselves so directed? Yes? <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, is, is reasonable, and uh, we will undertake uh, and we'll, we'll ask uh, uh, folks to discuss that with the, with the company that uh, the LAO hires for these things. Uh, so this motion is moved then by Mr. Churton. I'm not sure if I got a seconder, though, so that was on me. Uh, I've got one over here, Member Renault. Uh, and uh, uh, good. Uh, so do we have any further discussion on the motion? So I'll read it into the record. Then it's moved by Member Turton that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts direct uh, the Legislative Assembly Office to seek to have American Sign Language interpretation at its meeting on December 20th, 2022. So uh, looking to the floor for any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, any, all in favour? Any in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. That motion is carried. I'll also just note for the record, honourable members, that uh, written responses were received over the summer since our last meeting on May 24th. These were the ministry names prior to the Cabinet uh, uh, renaming and uh, shuffle in October. So uh, uh, we had Infrastructure, Muni Affairs, Executive Council, Indigenous Relations, Culture and Status of Women, Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Uh, all of the written responses are, are posted for the committee members as they were received and those documents uh, will be made publicly available shortly. Uh, so now we will move on to the date of our next meeting, which is next Tuesday, December 13th, 2022, at 8 a.m. with the Ministry of Children's Services. I'll now call uh, for a motion to adjourn. Would a member move that the meeting be adjourned? Member Pancholi, all in favour? Aye. Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.